Well, good morning. Uh, in Bible class, uh, we've been asking the question, can one person make a difference? And the, simpler, the simplest answer to that is yes, because Jesus. In fact, every sermon, every Lord's Supper lesson, every Bible class is about how Jesus made a difference in some way and continues to make a difference in our lives today. So in the interest of keeping this lesson to less than 10 hours, I want to talk specifically about how Jesus made a difference for tomorrow. Jesus made a difference for tomorrow. And I want to do that by using the song, Because He Lives, as an outline. So we'll look at that in a moment. But first, let's look in John 14. John 14. The song, Because He Lives, is rooted in this section of Scripture on the night before Jesus' death. He has been with the twelve disciples morning, noon, and night for over three years. But now he tells them he's going to die. He's going to resurrect from the grave and return to the Father. And, what, and imagine if you are the disciples, having been attached to Jesus' hip for three years, what an incredible difference that would have made in your life. And now Jesus is saying he's not going to be around anymore. Imagine how sad that would be and how scary that would be. How can, how can we face tomorrow without you, Jesus? Well, Jesus understood how they were feeling. And he offered these words of comfort. Verses 18 and 19 in John 14. Verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. And because I live, you will live also. Because Jesus would rise from the dead and live so too would the disciples live. Now, certainly that's true in the end, in the final bodily resurrection, but I don't think Jesus is limiting it to that. I think Jesus is talking about, you will live now. You will have a new life in me because of my resurrection. You too will have a spiritual resurrection in the waters of baptism and will have a whole new purpose, even though they're scared and sad. Jesus says, because I live, you're going to have a whole new life ahead of you, a whole new purpose in your future. If you'd like to grab a blue songbook and turn to number 610, 610, we'll be using it as an outline this morning, and, and we'll also be singing it after the Lord's Supper this morning. Notice that line one of the song focuses on the first century. It focuses on Jesus and then the empty grave. It says, God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Line 2 then transitions from the empty grave in the first century to our time now, to our modern day as we face the uncertainties of life. And it starts talking about a newborn baby, and you're like, what in the world is happening in this verse? To understand verse 2, it helps to know the background. This song was written in 1971 by Bill and Gloria Gaither. And in the late 1960s, Gloria was sitting in her living room gripped with fear because she found out that she and Bill were expecting a child. Now, normally that's, that's great news. That's not something terrifying. But the 60s were a time of extreme social upheaval. The God is dead movement was spreading across and corrupting the educational system. There were political assassinations, a drug trafficking ep epidemic. The sexual revolution was destroying the sanctity of the marriage union. There were constant threats of war in the news headlines, and racial tensions were high. Previous generations to theirs thought you know, life in America is pretty much over, and they, they pined for the good old days. And so she and Bill wondered how... 
How could they ever raise a child in such tumultuous times? And they wondered, is it even wise to bring a child into a world like this? But when she finally gave birth, Gloria said this, quote, It was in the midst of this kind of uncertainty that the certainty of the lordship of the risen Christ blew across our troubled minds like a cooling breeze in the parched desert. And holding our tiny son in our arms, we were able to write, How sweet to hold our newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. And then line three brings us to heaven. Safely past life's uncertain days where we'll finally see Christ's glory in all its fullness. And because Jesus lives, this song makes three points in the chorus. And that's what I want to use as the outline for the rest of the lesson this morning. Number one, because he lives... I can face tomorrow. For three full, action-packed, emotional years, the disciples spent all of their todays and tomorrows with Jesus. Yet when Jesus dies, their tomorrow is now completely uncertain. And Jesus understands this. And so he tells them, even after he's gone, they won't have to face tomorrow alone. Because he lives, he's going to send the Holy Spirit to help them. Same chapter, chapter 14, look in verse 16 and 17. He says, verse 16, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. There's There's just nothing more comforting than knowing God's spirit is with you. Jesus says his spirit will be with you forever. But it's not just the spirit who would help them face tomorrow. Jesus himself would help them too. Even after Jesus ascends to heaven, his disciples can still stay connected with him. Like a vine that gives life to the branches that it's connected to. And so in chapter 15, Jesus continues comforting them and says in verse 4 of 15, verse 4 and 5, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Vines give life, and life bears fruit. And because he lives, he he becomes, after his resurrection, this life-giving vine so that the disciples can bear amazing fruit in his kingdom while Jesus walks hand in hand with them, facing whatever tomorrows come their way. Jesus put it this way in the Great Commission, the end of Matthew's Gospel, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Did you notice in Bill and Gloria Gaither's story that the news headlines in the 1960s sound kind of like ours today? (laughs) Racial tensions high, a godless education system, destruction of the marriage institution, a drug epidemic, a previous generation pining for the good old days. And we may wonder, like Bill and Gloria. How how can we face tomorrow? How can our kids face tomorrow? Is it even wise to bring kids in this world? And the answer is absolutely. Because Jesus lives and he promises to be with us every step of the way. And consider this, John 14 was the night before Jesus' death. So tomorrow for him was going to be the most dreadful tomorrow anyone ever faced. And yet because Jesus conquered the worst tomorrow there ever was and lived, so can we. 
Secondly, because he lives, all fear is gone. Now, it's a song, right? It's using hyperbole. doesn't mean as Christians, like, we'll just never, ever feel fear about anything or be afraid of anything. No, it, it's that fear will not dominate our lives. And even when we are afraid, we will have the courage to face our fears like Jesus did. And so in John 14, verse 27, Jesus says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You know, Jesus' peace, it's, it's not like the world's peace. I mean, the world can give us some, you know, meditation techniques and some positive thinking, but there, there's just no peace like the peace Jesus gives us of knowing that we are right with the Lord and knowing that God and His Spirit are with us. And the truth is, Jesus, he conquered all of the most fearful things in life. And so look in John 16, John 16, verses 32 and 33. <laughs> Jesus says, behold, an hour is coming, verse 32, and has already come for you to be scattered each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone. Because the Father is with me. And these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage because I have overcome the world. Because Jesus lives, we don't have to fear dying. Because Jesus lives, we don't have to fear God's wrath for our sin. Because Jesus lives, we don't have to fear being alone or unloved. We don't have to fear a lack of purpose or mission in life. We don't have to fear COVID-19. We don't have to fear life not going our way. We don't have to fear persecution. We don't have to fear all the things in the news headlines that we really have no control over. And we don't have to fear bringing children into this world. Jesus faced the scariest situations imaginable. And even though he may have felt afraid at times because he was human and felt fear like all of us, he faced and conquered his fears with God by his side. And now so can we. And third and finally this morning, because he lives, life is worth living. Look in John 7 with me, please. John 7, Jesus is at the Feast of Booths. And that was a really kind of a, a call to, to mind or to the Jewish memory of their time in the wilderness wanderings where they were living in tents and God was providing for them. And one of the things God provided for them was light. And so at the same feast later uh, in John 8, he'll say, I'm the light of the world. You think God... You know, leading you in that, that, that pillar of fire was the true light. No, I'm the true light that leads you. Well, also what would have been on the Jewish mind is how God provided water for them and quenched their thirst in the wilderness. And so Jesus, verse 37, and again, I mean, we don't appreciate this, but if you're at this Jewish feast, I mean, this would have just hit, hit people like a, a ton of bricks. Verse 37 of John 7. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is saying, you remember that water in the desert that provided for your forefathers? I'm, I'm the water. Come to me. He's describing a spiritually hydrated life, <laughs> a, a refreshing life that's vibrant because of its connection to God. And then later in John 10, where he compares himself to the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And of course, that's, that's pulling up imagery from Psalm 23 in the Jewish mind. And, and he compares himself with the thieves. Uh, and he says in verse 10, the thief comes, John 10, 10, only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
You know, in their fear, Bill and Gloria, they, they weren't just unsure it was wise to bring a child into the world. They were unsure it was even worth it. Would life in this crazy, you know, sinful, chaotic world even be worth living for their child? Well, one bright and sunny spring day, Bill and Gloria, along with Bill's father, George, uh, they were walking across a paved parking lot at one of their offices, and George pointed out something to them that they had not noticed before. He pointed to a little crack in the concrete, and there was a, a single blade of grass that had come up through that concrete. And that single blade of grass uh, had overcome the odds, if you think about it, <laughs> to live and to flourish and to reach through those layers of dirt and rock and concrete to the sunshine above. And so it was that blade of grass that became the inspiration to write this song, Because He Lives. Because Jesus' life was like this flourishing blade of grass. Despite Jesus being surrounded by wickedness of all kinds in the Greco-Roman world, despite being buried under cultural expectations about who Jesus was supposed to be, despite being hated and hunted by the Pharisees, despite being buried in a tomb, having a stone rolled across the entrance, he was able not only to live, but to thrive. He showed us the most amazing life ever lived, and that life is very much worth living. If we'll live the abundant life he came to give us, Jesus showed us that life is worth living because we're sons and daughters of the king. And so we have an amazing identity. We have a, a purpose and a mission to love God and to love our neighbor and through the gospel to create more people who love God and neighbor so that the goodness of God can be spread throughout this world to the point where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus shows us even if we barely have enough money to get by and make ends meet, we can live an incredibly rich life. Even if there's war in the news headlines, we can have a community of peace among God's people. Even if we're single and unmarried, our life can have tremendous power and meaning like Jesus's did. Even if our culture completely disregards God's plan for marriage and destroys their relationships, we, we can enjoy marriage. We can actually follow God's plan and have a beautiful relationship like Christ's relationship with the church. Even if most people in our culture feel, feel hopeless, we can have an eternal hope that never fades away. And that brings us to verse 3. Then one day, I'll cross that river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. 2,000 years ago, Jesus made a difference. And because he lives, he continues to make all the difference in the world for tomorrow. Let's thank God and think about these things while we partake this morning.